Well, a warm welcome to this talk, Monday the 13th of November. Now, it looks like there's a bit of a revolution in medicine going on around the world with mRNA vaccine plants being set up in Canada, Australia, Europe, the United States, the United Kingdom to produce huge quantities of mRNA vaccines. So I think it's quite useful to look back and see how effective and safe the previous mRNA vaccines, indeed the current COVID vaccines, are. Are, which of course were the first uh, mRNA vaccines. Now if we look at the, va uh, the vaccine adverse events reporting system in the United States that used to get about 60,000 reports of adverse events per year. In the Covid era that's gone up to 1.7 uh, million, uh, 1.66 million reports since the vaccine was rolled out. Now this is similar to the situation in um, Western Australia. So we see the adverse reports here going along and then the vaccines were rolled out the mRNA COVID vaccines were rolled out and we see that the the number of adverse events being reported went up uh, slightly and this this focus today really is on this article here from the British Medical Journal is the US vaccine adverse events reporting system broken and if you haven't got time to watch this whole video, uh, there's a good reason to suspect that it's not working very well at all. But that's what the detail is about in this talk. So let's get straight down to this. It's a British Medical Journal investigation concerns about the vaccine adverse events reporting system. Check out the system there for yourself. Now, this is there to capture post-market safety signals and are signals being missed is the question and it looks like they probably uh, are now it gives an example here robert sullivan dr robert sullivan anesthesiologist maryland very fit particularly fit a skier 49 year old man uh, after the second dose of the vaccine two weeks later collapsed at home on his treadmill diagnosed with sudden onset of pulmonary hypertension pulmonary of course is the lungs so the blood supply to the lungs the the blood pressure in the lung arterial system taking blood from the right side of the heart to the uh, lungs um, that pressure greatly went up now this condition is rare in middle-aged men and it's typically progressive so it's quite a, an alarming thing to be diagnosed with really dr sullivan of course being a doctor himself filled out a VAERS report he said the submission process was glitchy and a race against the clock he had to try and get it done before the web site timed you out the format is cumbersome and times you out and i'm sure we've all been there you've spent ages filling a form out online and then all of a sudden it goes ping out of time and you've got to go right back to the beginning drives you completely mad um it might discourage you from filling out a report in fact uh, let's hope that hasn't happened in this situation in fact uh, dr sullivan persevered he did get an e-report number to say it uh, reports um but uh, the VAERS is supposed to be user-friendly, responsive and transparent, but it, it appears not. So all he seems to have from that is an e-report number. Uh, more on the difficulties on this in a minute. Now, the background here is there's been an unprecedented, completely unprecedented 1.66 million reports uh, since the rollout of the COVID vaccines. Uh, the vast majority of the uh, reports are COVID vaccines. So, yeah, there's some adverse reactions from other vaccines, but the vast majority are COVID vaccines. And nearly one out of five of these reports meets the criteria for being serious adverse reactions. So this is not just like reporting a sore arm. These are more serious adverse events that have occurred in temporal correlation after the COVID vaccine. Before the pandemic, it was 60,000 events a year. Staffing levels seem to have failed to keep pace with what's going on. Signs that the system is being overwhelmed. Reports aren't being follow up, followed up and signals are being missed is what the concerns of the British Medical Journal article are. And uh, do read this article for yourself. It is not in medical jargon at all. It is remarkably easy to read and, of course, includes a lot more detail that I'm necessarily uh, missing out. I'm just summarising what it's saying here. BMJ spokesman uh, spoken to physicians in a state and a state medical examiner. So the BMJ have interviewed physicians in the states directly and a state medical examiner who filled out reports and uh, some were never contacted uh, by clinical reviewers or were contacted months later. The whole point is this is supposed to be essentially 
real time system, but doesn't seem to be uh, working in real time. VAS databases include only initial reports. Case updates and corrections are kept in a separate back system. A private back end system containing all updates and corrections, such as formal diagnoses, recovery or death to protect patient confidentiality. But of course, what this means is available to the public, we have these front end reports, which could contain errors that aren't corrected. But the back end reports, which we've got all the details in and the follow up and as far as it's done, of course, uh, with the diagnosis, recovery or death is not available to the public. So that means it's not available to the likes of you and me. And more importantly, it's not available to independent researchers and statisticians who could be working out the detail on this. We talked to Jessica Rose on this channel, for example. Uh, and we would have to assume that she's only got access to the front end reports, not to the back end reports, because they're private. Um, you might think that's a little bit unsatisfactory. Um, you might even think that's a little bit secretive. But um, that's my understanding of the uh, of the article. Patients, doctors, public only have access to incomplete and uncorrected front end versions of the reports, rather unsatisfactory. Marie Lindquist, former director of Uppsala Monitoring Centre, well-known international monitoring centre in Sweden, says this. Good pharmacovigilance, which is what this is, requires prompt data collection, reviewed by people with clinical expertise and adequate follow-up. We know that even the best clinical trials won't detect rare adverse events. So this is absolutely essential that needs to be done. And in a sophisticated country like the United States, really, I would have expected quite a lot better. Although <laughs> the more you learn about the United States, the less sometimes sophisticated you think it is. I'm not saying we're any better here. Um, estimates about the amount of yellow card reports that are actually reported could be as low as 2% and other reports say 3 4 5% for less serious reactions and maybe not more than 10% for serious reactions. So we're not doing any better in the uh, United Kingdom. Um but sticking with the VAERS in the United States, CDC has reviewed nearly 20,000 preliminary reports of deaths using VAERS. So CDC has reviewed nearly 20,000 reports of deaths in temporal correlation to COVID vaccines. Uh, but the CDC has not acknowledged a single death link to mRNA uh, vaccines. So if you're in the States, you might be very reassured by this, that the CDC has officially recognised no deaths from COVID vaccines. As I say, you may be reassured by that. Of course, you may not be reassured by that. Um, February 2021, Pfizer analysis of adverse events reports. Now, I believe this comes from a Freedom of Information request. Um, Pfizer had taken on apparently uh, onboarded 600 additional full-time employees to handle the volume and plan to employ a total of 1,800. We don't know how many are actually employed now. But it looks like Pfizer had plans to employ 1,800 people to uh, monitor the adverse events. And as we know, February 2021, they'd taken on 600 additional people to monitor the adverse events from the safe and effective uh, vaccines. You might think that's a lot of people between 600 and 1800 to monitor adverse events of uh, safe and effective vaccines. But that would just be you thinking about this. Dr. Patrick Whelan, rheumatologist and researcher, University of California, Los Angeles. 2022 reported a seven year old boy who had a cardiac arrest after COVID vaccination. The doctor says this, I assume that since it was a catastrophic event, the safety committee would want to hear about this right away. Well, yeah, I would have expected them to be over this like a rash, to be quite honest. To his knowledge, nobody called or requested medical records. Now, I believe the um, the verse did say that they had, but there seems to be a bit of a contradiction uh, there. The reporting doctor wasn't aware of this. Dr. James Gill, medical examiner and Forsnick pathologist, Connecticut, June 2021. 
Fair's report, first, so he put in the first Fair's report of his 25 years career. So this is a, this is a medical examiner and a forensic pathologist, forensic pathologist. Um, 25 years experience, put in his first VAERS report in June 2021. After 25 years, a 15-year-old boy who died suddenly days after a second jab. Doesn't mean to say that the jab caused it, of course. We're not saying that. Of course not. This is a temporal correlation. This is something that needs to be investigated. Urgently, I would have thought, wouldn't you? 15-year-old boy dying. It doesn't get a lot more tragic than that, does it? Anyway, um, he did the uh, post-mortem, the autopsy himself, and diagnosed stress cardiomyopathy following second dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine. Remember, this is a experienced medical examiner and a forensic pathologist. Dr. Gill can't recall getting any calls from bears after he filled out the online form. Still only has a temporary e-report number. And again, my understanding is that if you go and look for this, you'll only find a front-end report, not one with any uh, follow-up detail uh, on it. Uh, November 2022, REACT19 group of 30,000 people who have experienced prolonged illness after COVID vaccinations. Reviewed 126 VAERS reports among its ranks. One in three of the reports they look for didn't show up in the public searchable database. So that's getting on for 33%, I guess. Um, one in three anyway didn't uh, show up on the public searchable database. Only two out of three didn't. Uh, only two out of three showed up. What happened to the other third? Um, it's not clear. Dr. Helen, not her real name. And of course, we've interviewed a few doctors on this channel and um, quite a few of you have pointed out that some of them are, without being disrespectful towards the end of their career or retired, um, people still employed might be less willing to, uh, to speak out. Um, Dr. Helen, intensive care physician, emergency physician, filled out reports on behalf of several patients, including six who sadly died. Again, we're not saying that they died because of the vaccine. This is a temporal correlation which needs to be urgently investigated. Received a request for medical records for just one of the deaths. How can you work out what's going on without the medical record? You simply can't. You're not meeting your defined uh, de definition. Follow-up uh, is suggested in the article. There's a breakdown in your system, she says. Now, the FDA is not naming additional adverse reactions to the vaccines because passive surveillance aren't displaying it. But the passive surveillance systems aren't displaying it because the physicians are blinded to the adverse reactions in their patients and thus aren't reporting them. I guess this is a kind of a, a catch-22 uh, uh, situation. Doctors don't know what to look for because the passive surveillance system isn't flagging it up. This means, for example, neurological pathologies that have been well recognised as uh, vaccine complications in Japan and in Europe uh, don't seem to be getting recognised anything like as much in the United States. Because the passive reporting systems aren't flagging it up, the doctors don't know what to look for. Therefore, the big, the big thing this could well be missing is the delayed reactions. What if there's a neurological reaction a year after? 18 months after a vaccination? We, we, we don't know. We, we need to know what the possible adverse reactions are so that clinicians can be alert to anything. Ah, ah, new neurological condition there altered sensation on that part of the surface of the body, could this be a vaccine reaction? But of course, to know that, you need to know what the adverse reactions are. A bit of a negative spiral, really. Um, now, FDA responded by email. Uh, it's uh, actively engaged in safety surveillance of these vaccines to identify and address potential safety concerns. Good. That's what they're saying. Physicians and epidemiologists from the FDA and CDC continuously screen and analyse data from the VAERS for COVID-19 vaccines to identify potential signals that would indicate the need for further study. Um, 
I'm just wondering, is, is there a need for further study? You know what, I think there probably is. I don't think we need to analyse more reports to think there's a need for further study. We need further study, in my humble opinion. And uh, in, I know in a lot of your opinions uh, as well. FDA Adverse Rent Reporting System. Now this is the uh, adverse reporting system for the uh, drugs. And it does maintain a publicly accessed database that gets updated. So why can they update the database for drugs and not for vaccines? Surely the confidentiality issues would be uh, equally present in both situations. You might think that's a little inconsistent. Leave the last word. Uh, Harlem uh, Krumschholz, cardiologist and researcher, Yale. Um, we're working hard to understand the uh, experience, clinical course and potential mechanisms of the ailments reported by those who have had severe symptoms arise soon after the vaccination. That's exactly what we're doing. There are so many people whose lives have been changed dramatically. This is quite sobering, really. Um, there are so many people whose lives have been changed dramatically. But what I don't know is how many or why. So we'll leave that there from a cardiologist in uh, Yale. Um, let's get all this data into the public domain. We are not short of brilliant analysis people around the world. If this data was clearly in the public domain, people like Jessica Rose would be all over it, I am quite sure, and come up with uh, good data. People like Norman Fenton would be all over this, if it were available. And, and thousands of other epidemiologists and statisticians around the world and uh, independent uh, data analysts. But of course, they can't analyse what they can't access. Pity they can't access it. Really a pity. If they could access it, we would know more. But maybe we know enough to already have a concern. We'll leave it there. We'll only say what's in the paper. Um, there it is. Do read it for yourself. As I say, completely readable, uh, accessible. BMJ have kindly left this in the public domain. And... Uh, eminently readable no difficult uh, uh, medical uh, jargon to wrestle with very interesting read for now thank you for watching